always forget this part. Hi, I am Deborah Herberger from West Ed. West Ed is a nonprofit education agency. Um, we specialize in everything in education, professional learning for teachers, research policy. This kind of gives you a visual glimpse of what it is that we do in all facets. And so that's a little bit about West Ed. A little bit about me. I was a teacher for many, many years before I joined West Ed, and now my focus is on uh, working with teachers so that we can improve inclusive practices for students with disabilities. All right, so let's take a look at our goals. If you do get a chance, um, I think Gabby right now is making that note taking form available so you can um, open it up. It's just a Word doc, so you can type right into it. Uh, and if you do take advantage of that, this is the slide 10, this would be the first box on that form. So these are our goals for our session today. There will be um, a couple of times, as Gabby said, I'll stop and we'll have, have some very specific questions and ask you to share in the chat box. Um, and at the end, we will also have time to share and answer questions. Want your input as well. But our big goals is building on that foundational knowledge of the HLPs in special education to really emphasize those opportunities to strengthen collaboration. Um, explore some resources. If you haven't had a chance to explore some of the resources, there are some really great ones that might not be as obvious as other ones. And so I wanted to share some of those with you and really identifying, again, how can we apply those practices via the distance learning model that is something we are all learning together. So that's going to be our big goal for our time together today. All right, a little bit of background, not a ton of background, um, but a little bit of a background about the HLPs. Um, so quick review of the purpose and the criteria. When you look at the criteria that was established for developing the HLPs in special education, the criteria was a focus on instruction, directly focus on instruction. Practices that occur in high frequency, they're research-based, they foster student engagement, they are applied broadly across content and grade levels. So not something that's specific only to science, right? So apply broadly and is fundamental to effective teaching. So those were the criteria. Now, while we look at these criteria, we say, well, absolutely, those are essential to special education. They are just as essential to general education. So just want to emphasize that because there's, there's uh, this kind of persistent misunderstanding sometimes on the part of our gen ed colleagues that what happens in special ed is only for students with disabilities. And so really want to demystify that misunderstanding, kind of address it directly head on. All right, a few words in this statement kind of stand out, right? This was uh, from a presentation uh, done between uh, CEC and the Cedar Center on September 5th, 2018, and it was called Revolutionized Instruction for Students with Disabilities, and it was an intro um, to the high leverage practices in special ed. And just a few of those words that stand out, I'm going to give you a moment to kind of think about it and talk about it. So let me have you read that for a moment. And then the question to share in the chat box is, as you think about this statement regarding practices that are most fundamental to good teaching and providing FAPE, what, what connections to inclusion and to general ed can we make, right? Practices that are most fundamental to good teaching and providing a free and appropriate public education. How can we make explicit connections to inclusion, inclusive practices, and gen ed? So we'd love to see what you might have to say in the chat box. And for some reason, Gabby, I am not able to see the chat box, so I'm gonna need your help with that. Sure, I am monitoring as I come in. I think people are still thinking on it. Well, and we can also save this for the end of our presentation if people are still pondering. I think they are. Okay. 
So just something, we'll just kind of plant that seed and have you keep thinking about it. All right, let's take a look then. Excuse me, advance the slide. All right, high leverage practices. Um, a couple of useful resources I really wanted to point out. As I said, if you've explored the website already, the HLP website, you'll see a lot of resources. And a couple specifically, I think that will help with our efforts in getting our gen ed colleagues on board. One is, um, these are both uh, created in collaboration between CEC and the Cedar Center. Um, one illustrates the direct alignment between the HLPs and evidence-based practices for gen ed. And that is the one uh, that's, that's called a promising pair, HLPs and evidence-based practices, a promising pair. It gives that direct alignment. Um, the other one is uh, a crosswalk that shows the connections between the high leverage practices in gen ed, high leverage practices in special ed, and professional standards for leadership. And that picture is in that upper right-hand corner of the slide, so you can see what that looks like. But those are a couple of resources that I think directly help in our efforts in helping our colleagues understand that these practices, while essential for special education, are beneficial and necessary and totally connected to the evidence-based practices for gen ed. So a couple of those resources I just wanted to point out. I also want to talk a little bit about how the HLPs in special education are um, organized or categorized. They have uh, been categorized in these four uh, components of teacher practice. So collaboration, assessment, social emotional behavioral practices, and instruction. However, I don't want anybody to think that these are separate categories like, oh, these three or four HLPs are just in collaboration because they are intertwined. That's how they were designed and that's how they are intended to be practiced and applied. So I just want to kind of point that out. We, we often, we like to be able to sort things and put them in their boxes, but we need to recognize how they are uh, connected to each other. The reason that intertwinedness, that seamless connection is so important, because when you think about it, if we're gonna collaborate with each other, with our gen ed colleagues, with the students themselves, with parents and families, well, what are we collaborating about? We're collaborating about instruction, or we're collaborating about the data from assessments, or we're collaborating about social emotional needs or behavioral supports. So they're, they're all intertwined and connected. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. It's something for us to keep in mind, especially as we start thinking, how can we share uh, the HLPs in special education with gen ed colleagues? How can we get them moved beyond the special ed world? And so helping them see those connections, I think is really, really important. All right, the primary purpose of the high leverage practices in special education, the reason they were designed really was for teacher preparation programs. Wanted to strengthen that foundational knowledge of our special education teachers who are preparing to go out and become teachers in our system, right? While they were established for the purpose of refining teacher prep programs, I want you to think, how can they be a cornerstone of current professional development for our current teachers out in the field? General ed, special ed, our instructional coaches, our site leaders, right? Um, I like to think uh, that I can imagine in this future world <laughs> when all special ed teachers that are out in the field have already been trained. This was a, an essential part of their teacher prep program. They have this foundational knowledge of their practice and what might that then look like. And while that is wonderful, I think it's also essential that we continue our efforts to strengthen the knowledge and practice of our special ed teachers that are currently in the field. And one of the things um, in my work working with so many of them in schools and districts is that these are teachers I see working very hard every day, working on inclusion and seeking the research, seeking the evidence based practices to provide the most effective teaching and learning environment for students with disabilities in the gen ed classroom. So I just want to have you think about that, that while the HLPs and special ed were designed for teacher prep programs, that was the intent, um, they certainly can have an impact well beyond that. Um, another question for you to kind of think about, 
as those teacher prep programs across the country begin to really utilize the HLPs as part of their teacher training, just kind of think, imagine what changes to current inclusive practices would you hope to eventually see take place? Thinking about what happens in your own organization currently, some of the great innovations, as well as some of the challenges. And so just something to kind of think about and we can maybe share our thoughts at the end. All right, a little bit of data and information. About 60% of students with disabilities, and this is a nationwide perspective, um, receive instruction in the general education classroom. So about 60%. The context is important to note because it's not only special education teachers that need to be prepared and supported to meet the needs of our students with disabilities, but our gen ed colleagues, right? That said, general education teachers continue to report that they feel unprepared and or underprepared to take on this role and that they have been provided little preparation and experience with students with disabilities throughout their own preparation programs. This lack of preparation likely results in a lack of confidence among general education teachers. This leads to an increase uh, referral to special ed and equitable access to gen ed curriculum and ongoing core learning outcomes for students with disabilities. I don't think this information comes as any surprise. We've known this for a long time. We all are working in our efforts to change this, but it still is out there. One of the, um, I think, big hopes around utilizing the HLPs in special ed with our gen ed colleagues is addressing that, that feeling of under and unprepared and addressing bringing an end to the cycle of if I'm a gen ed teacher and I have a student with a disability that's not doing well, then they go somewhere else. They go to a different classroom. They go to a different teacher. Um, the assumption and tradition that whatever their needs are cannot be met in the gen ed classroom. So kind of helping to assuage that and remedy that. All right, a little bit more background information. Um, Research confirms that initial teacher prep programs is not enough um, to ensure that teachers can implement effective instructional practices, most particularly those evidence-based practices with effective fidelity. And that is for gen ed as well as special ed teacher prep programs, right? Moving teachers from novices to experts requires training, 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 <laughs> professional learning, support that is focused, occurs over time, and is coherent. Likewise, providing consistent expectations of instructional practice from pre-service to ongoing in-service that are paired with those multiple practice-based opportunities is more likely to lead to improved teacher practices, which is more likely to lead to improved student learning outcomes, right? It's all connected. Okay, a little bit about the benefits of designing professional development for current special ed and gen ed teachers on the HLPs in special education. I don't think any of these benefits will come as a surprise. I'm sure you could add some of your own to it. But uh, the first one is establish and build or continue to build a culture, school-wide, district-wide culture, where all educators have the understanding, knowledge, skills, and experience to educate all learners, right? that addressing that underprepared and lack of experience with students who learn differently and express their learning differently. Another benefit is that general and special educators learning and practicing effective instructional practices together strengthen collaboration and breaks down misunderstandings about students with disabilities. So one of the, the things I would hope that we are already starting to see, and I've seen it in places and that this would just continue to build is that when a school or district is offering professional learning for um, science teachers who have new science curriculum for the next gen science standards, that special education teachers are a part of that learning, that professional learning alongside their gen ed colleagues, and that the high leverage practices on how to deliver that content is a seamless part of that training. It's not a separate add-on. It's not where we learn about our content and our standards first, and then we learn about this stuff for special ed. That just like with universal design for learning, it's seamless. It's not an add-on. It's not something extra 
um, and that it, it happens together and it really strengthens that collaboration. Another benefit is um, just really reinforcing this concept that what's essential for some students is gonna be beneficial for all learners. When teachers learn and practice the HLPs in special education, students with disabilities are gonna be receiving what is essential for them to be able to learn. And students without disabilities are gonna benefit from those same evidence-based practices. So some of those benefits of thinking about how do we bring in the HLPs in special ed for professional learning for everybody, right? Um, and then I, I, I stole this, this quote from the CCSSO report from a couple of years ago, and it really stands out to me, this idea that, that for all to mean all, it actually has to mean each, right? That we often think about all educators need to educate all students, but we actually need to drill down and what does that mean for each student? And the HLPs really kind of highlight how we can address the learning needs of individual students who learn and think differently. So I think that's really critical. And I want you to think about that and we'll have that at the end with our questions and responses. But what do you see would be the benefits of providing professional learning for your current educators on those HLPs in special education? Okay, so many resources that I want to point out um, to help you. And I've been talking about professional development for everybody. So they have created a professional development guide that has everything you can imagine and didn't even know you needed available for you. They have sample agendas. They have suggested talking points. They have the complete PowerPoint slides with narration. Uh, discussion question, planning tools, and even teacher reflection tools. Uh, they are divided into sections of a basic intro and background, uh, exploration of individual HLPs, how to develop professional development in the HLPs, and then reflecting on the application and practice. So if you're thinking, hmm, maybe I do want to provide some professional development on this, where do I begin? Definitely take a look at that tab on the professional development guide and I am not kidding, you will see everything that you could imagine wanting to use. There are eight high leverage practices in special education videos illustrating nine of the HLPs in practice in various classrooms, various subject areas. There's also uh, quite a few longer unedited clips of teachers implementing the HLPs in special education. So these ones uh, will take a little bit more of time on your part to identify which HLPs they're um, addressing. They're longer, and again, they are in a range of content areas and grade levels. Some include even co-teaching between Jeanette and special ed. So definitely explore those. One thing, a little caveat about the HLPs, or the videos rather, um, the edited and unedited clips, they are intended to augment and support whatever training or professional learning you want to provide, they are not uh, considered a complete professional learning resource on its own. So you would not shoot out the videos to people and say, okay, watch these and good, now we're trained. Um, and I'm just, I'm just uh, letting you know that because the CEC really stresses that, that they are meant to augment your professional training, not be the professional training. So I just wanted to kind of reinforce that. So another question um, that we can share at the end, how are you thinking you could utilize some of these resources? And also think, who are the audiences that you want to reach? And if you had to kind of triage or prioritize, who would you start with? Where would you want to begin? And what would that look like? How can you incorporate this in professional learning across your organization, not just that separate special ed learning opportunity, right? Okay. Give you a minute to think about that. We will talk about these at the end. Okay, one more resource to share, and we are actually going to dive in and look at some examples from this one, because um, this is literally coming soon to a theater near you in publication right now. And when I say soon, I think by the end of next week, this will be available. So this comes from the National Center on Systemic Improvement. And what they wanted to put together was uh, very clear suggestions 
and examples of how to apply the high leverage practices in special education to distance learning, since that is such a new uh, challenge for many of us. So we wanted to make that explicit connection, give some resources, and give those examples. Um, one, one thing I will say about this publication, it gives those suggestions and examples for how to apply um, HLPs in distance learning. It is, it is not a, um, an emergency remote teaching COVID-19 response document, if that makes sense. It's about distance learning, whether it's an emergency situation, distance learning, or any virtual learning um, experience. So I just wanted to kind of mention that. All right, so what do they look like? What is in this publication? How they're designed is through that crosswalk I mentioned at the beginning of our um, session, the crosswalk that connected the high leverage practices in general ed to the high leverage practices in special ed. So that's how this document is also designed. Each page focuses on one of the HLPs in gen ed and the correlational HLPs in special ed. Below each of the HLPs in special ed is a list of suggestions and examples on how to apply it via distance learning. And there, each page also includes links to a couple of very specific resources, including if there is a video for that HLP, just to expand on people's um, learning. All right, so let's take a look. I think I have three examples. There's 19 in total in this publication, and we'll take a look at three of them. Actually, before I dive in, Gabby, are there any other questions or anything in the chat box we should address or wait until the end? Let's see, one person was asking um, which site the PD was located on. Um, so I linked to the highleveragepractices.org slash resources. Perfect. Available, um, and then other people were, were just sharing some of their uh, experiences saying, for example, like in NYC, each HLP is used as a focus for special ed liaison meetings and that teacher prep tends more towards understanding disabilities without a strong focus on HLP. Um, but other than that, not too many questions. Okay, I love that example, the NYC example of looking at one of the HLPs as part of their ongoing meetings. And I love that. Thank you for sharing. Okay, hopefully we'll hear some more at the end when we have set aside some time. All right, so let's take a look at what each page uh, will kind of, um, the information you will find on each page of this publication. Um, so this is an example for the Gen Ed HLP1 leading a group discussion. So that's the Gen Ed HLP. You can see on the left side of the slide, so what are the corresponding HLPs in special education? So HLP9, we need to directly teach social behaviors. HLP14, teach cognitive and metacognitive strategies to support learning and independence. And HLP18, use strategies to promote active student engagement. So you can also see that here for HLP9, there's a link to a resource, um, Digital Citizenship Lessons from Common Sense for K-12. So we need to teach social behaviors. Well, for digital, for online learning, that's gonna be some digital citizenship lessons. And Common Sense has a series of them for all these grade levels. For HLP14, we have a link to a teacher's guide on how to teach metacognitive strategies to students. And for HLP18, we have a link to the video example from the HLP website. And then we have some suggestions, and this is just a sample of the suggestions that would be on this page. So I just grabbed a few to show you. So for teaching social behaviors, well, we do that in the gen ed classroom, in the face-to-face in-person classroom all the time, right? At every grade level, we teach students, here's how we interact with each other. We'll continue to do that in distance learning. Some of the differences will be, what are those norms for how we ask questions and speak to each other in a live online classroom? How do we ask questions and interact with each other in a not live platform, like answering each other's questions on a Padlet wall? Review the classroom norms that students are already familiar with and ask, how does that transfer to a, learning, a digital learning environment? 
So how do you raise a virtual hand for a discussion? How do you add appropriate comments to a chat box? So all of those things that we would have to directly specifically teach, we're still teaching social behaviors, how does that translate to that digital virtual world? Um, hold virtual office hours where uh, students can check in on both academic and non-academic questions. And when it says office hours, it might be 15 minutes at a time with, a, with students one at a time and that they have a schedule that every Tuesday at this time is their time they can check in just for any reason. Provide suggested schedules that include those virtual field trips, creative activities, physical actions, ideas for PE, purposeful brain breaks. Help students and families create that schedule with them so that they know that the expectation isn't that students are at a computer for seven hours every day learning. Um, and provide multiple ways for how students can communicate with the teacher and the teacher can communicate with the student. So various digital platforms like a class padlet wall, digital portfolios, um, short videos, flip grid, things like that, right? So lots of different suggestions. And this is, as I said, just a snapshot. All right, let's take a look at, I think I have two more examples. HLP3 for Gen Ed, eliciting and interpreting students' thinking. So the corresponding HLPs in special ed, HLP 18, use strategies to promote active student engagement. Now we just saw that in the HLP one that we went over and you will see that many of the HLPs in special ed, they will be repeated as being correlational to the HLPs in gen ed, which makes sense, right? So HLP 18, use strategies to promote active student engagement. There is a link there to PBS Learning Media that has really great interactive lessons that are all designed around engagement. HLP 20, provide intensive instruction. And there is a link, I don't know why it didn't show up here, but there is a link to a resource on that as well. Uh, and I believe it comes from, nope, totally went out of my head, the inclusive, uh, intensive in inclusive website, I believe. Uh, HLP 21, teach students to maintain and generalize new learning across time and settings. This comes from uh, Jim Wright Online, the Intensive Intervention Special Needs, how to do that generalization specifically for students with disabilities. And then HLP 22, provide positive and constructive feedback to guide students' learning and behavior. And there's a link to an HLP video of that in practice. And there's also a link to EdTech Tools, um, a curated list from Edutopia on how to provide digital feedback to students. And then on the right hand side again, you'll see an example of some suggestions for how to apply these HLPs via distance learning. And we'll look at one last example and then I think we will take some questions. Hopefully people will have an opportunity to chat. Um, HLP 19, analyzing instruction for the purpose of improving it. The correlational HLP in special ed is number six, use student assessment data analyze instructional practices, and make necessary adjustments that approve student outcomes. There's a link to Common Sense Media that has a curated list of um, ed tech tools for authentic assessment of students. And then the suggestions on the right and another link to UDL guidelines of action and expression when it comes to how do students kind of demonstrate their knowledge, learning, and growth, those multiple, multiple ways. I did want to point out, you probably noticed, that for each of the HLPs in Gen Ed, there may be several corresponding HLPs in Special Ed that align to it, or in this case, there's one. Um, so I just kind of wanted to point that out. You probably noticed and wanted to make that very, very clear. All right, questions? We didn't get a chance to stop and ask questions in. And again, I'm not sure, Gabby, why I'm not able to see the chat box. I'm gonna have to rely on you. Um, and then those great ideas you have for practicing the HLPs in special ed. And do we wanna to stick to the chat box or let people um, unmute and participate? Sure, people are welcome to unmute themselves. Um, we do have a few in the chat though, so I'll go ahead okay. and share those with you first. Um, so one person was mentioning their current struggle with helping a student um, who has hearing loss in regards to distance learning. And do you know of any resources to help there? 
they know that Google needs to do closed captioning, but that's all they found so far. Yeah, um, I do actually, and I have a whole list of them. If that person, um, Gabby, can you actually give my email address? If that person could email me, I will send them links. Um, there's quite a good collection. I mean, not brilliant, right? We would always look for more, um, but there is quite a few resources specifically for students that are deaf and hard of hearing via distance learning. So Great. if you want to shoot me an email, I will shoot that right back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'll drop in Deborah's email into the chat just if anyone wanted to reference that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then another question was, does the guide address co-teaching models? Um, the HLPs in special education does not explicitly have anything in there that addresses co-teaching. Many of those unedited video clips that I mentioned have a co-teaching model in practice and they're implementing the HLPs. One of the future publications that we were just talking about, um, the NCSI folks, after this one is uh, finished and published, as we said, would be, so now what does that look like in a co-teaching model? And it would be similar to this one, which here's the HLPs, now here's how to apply it in co-teaching. So that's kind of on our, on our list of what to do next with it. Because again, if we're trying to use these to promote collaboration, well, that's one of the highest levels of inclusive practices for collaboration. So it would nice, be nice to make those explicit connections. So that, that would be a future hope. Great question.